Well, hello. Familiar faces. Well, 177 days ago today, the Lord once again wrapped his arms around Carla and I when a hurricane, Category 5, hit Fort Myers. You may have seen us on the Weather Channel. I was over there. That was me. Um, changed our whole world. Our kids mandated that we would leave and go to Fort Lauderdale because certainly this is going to be a bad storm. And of course, being the father and knowing better, I assured her we're, we're fine. And uh, then we got them crying on the phone to us saying, you got to leave now. Okay, to appease the kids, we'll leave. Had we have not, uh, we may not have been here today. Uh, our, our home received, after the surge, 6.8 feet of water in it, and uh, a number of people in our park chose to uh, stay, a few of them, and were swimming at the very top of their mobile homes, and uh, Ron actually said he had a fish swim by him. <laughs> Anyways, you had to be there to, uh, to experience it. You know, we had stayed, we, we took a suitcase with us because we were going to be there one night. And we got to the hotel in Fort Lauderdale, all a miracle, every, every part of this journey, God had our back from the very moment. If I was to name a sharing on this, it would be, therefore comfort one another with these words. And I would end with, therefore comfort one another with these words that our God is always with us. I love the song I heard prior to the service today. Uh, my, our new theme song is, um, I'll praise you in the storm, because God certainly is a God who does that, and we certainly have need for that. You know, I think, uh, I, I think of the devastation of our home, we lost everything, okay? We moved there thinking we would start a new uh, ministerially and, and life-wise, I remember when Reverend Finnegan and his wife came down and spent an afternoon with us. It was a nice place, wasn't it? <laughs> Anyways, you know, uh, yeah, the storm was bad, and it still is. We wouldn't be able to go down and move there again for minimally a year. And that's at the best case scenario, because it's like a war zone. It's interesting how people don't, when you turn the channel off of a storm, uh, you, you, you go into the mode of next, you know, what's next? You know, you, you forget that people are still there. You know, thousands of people died uh, during the storm, and much, much of it was recorded, but not all. You know, the, the other day in Turkey, 52,000 record that they record so far, 52,000 people died in an earthquake. Can, we, can, you, can you put your mind around that for a second? Between hurricanes and earthquakes, and Angela tells me that hundreds of people that they all know of only, just last night in Louisiana or somewhere in tornadoes, lost their life. I look at things and I say to myself, the times that changed my life, when my life changed, which I had nothing to do with. Now, and every one of us have those same issues in our life. They're not bad issues. There are things that in Ecclesiastics you would say, this is happen chance. It just happened. You didn't deserve it. You, 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 it's happen chance. It's part of your life. It's there now. I remember um, times have changed my life. Okay, biggest thing that ever happened to me when I ch changed my life, other than my my marriage and my Lord, is recognition that I that Santa Claus was Santa Claus wasn't real. Okay, changed my life. I'm 67 years old, I still remember this. My point is, when my mom and dad got divorced, it changed my life, my world changed. 
and not for the better. You know, meeting Jesus in 1973, Shelby County Fairgrounds, listening to Happy to Be Home Again, <laughs> you know, changed my life for the first time, you know, for the better, where I had began a relationship with our Lord Jesus. And I thank God I began it. It has not stopped and it never will. Um, and then, of course, when I got married, changed my life with all my heart. Changed my life when I had cancer and they told me I was terminally ill. 31 years old. Changed my life. We all have situations that changed our life. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Christ is returning. I say these things because we, you know, we, we all live in the same muck and mire. You know, uh, it's, uh, we praise God for his goodness. We praise God that we know that our Lord Jesus Christ has offered us salvation. You know, one way out of this place, folks, his name is Jesus. <laughs> the closer your relationship to him, the much better off you'll be. I do remember coming back from Fort Lauderdale with Carla and, uh, I can't recall who was on the phone with us. Maybe Debbie Culp or I, somebody. And they said, you guys are laughing and joking around. Why are you joking around? I said, well, if it's not the joy of the Lord in your heart, the circumstances are always going to be bad. The circumstances are seldom good in this world. But the glory that's coming. You know, the things that the Lord shows you when you're going through these terrible times, the privilege it is to have had these traumas in my life. The privilege it has been, you know, the greatest time I ever learned about my relationship with my God when I was terminally ill. What a great time to learn about God. You know, I, I was so excited about being homeless for the first time. Oh, for the first time, I'm sorry, I'll see you here. For the first time in my life, I was homeless. Something new. I've never been homeless. So how cool this was. It's all about your perspective with the Lord. It's all about how do you know Jesus Christ? And how do you know the truths of God's word? He promises us eternal life. He promises us who are faithful in Christ eternal life. Come what may, what matters, eternal life. The best you get out of this world is 80, 90 years. And none of it's all pretty. None of it's all pretty. And I'm not trying to be a downer here, but I'm just trying to, to please, please understand God's purpose for mankind is to be with him. And for those of us who truly trust in him, we will be. Forever and ever. Forever and ever. What a great understanding. A house will get another one. In fact, God told me that. Here I was on the 13th floor of the hotel room, just my wife, myself, a dog, three cats, thinking we we're going to be there for an afternoon. Eight days later, we finally got to go somewhere else. We haven't been home since. We don't have a home. We don't have a home. It doesn't matter. God told me in my heart, you lost everything. You lost everything that doesn't matter. It's just stuff. You have Christ living in your heart. He's living there. He, this is where he resides. He lives here. What joy. Oh, God. What? You know, if God be for us, right, who can be against us? What shall separate us from the love of God? What can separate you? My son wrote this uh, on his computer, and it's an acronym, P-D-L-I-F. P-D-L-I-F. And after I finish, I'll... See if you can figure it out. It's all, it's just fear. It's just illusion. God has your back. Jesus' blood. Come on now. 
The blood of Christ is all over us. We are saying we are wholly set apart by God Almighty. Will troubles come every day? Will your life change probably another 10 times before you die? You know, but they just do. But it just doesn't matter because we have our Lord Jesus. And our Lord, and it's just not, and by the way, I love the way you play. I, I just love your music. But it's, we have our Lord Jesus. We have, we have, Jesus Christ is your Lord. Not President O'Biden. <laughs> Jesus Christ is your Lord. So never forget that. You know, you know, I've had heart attacks. I've had, we left Albany because of COVID. We got down to Florida. All that took place. Jesus says, peace I give you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. I hope you have the privilege to have a terminal disease someday. And I mean with all my heart. It's the greatest experience in the world to see how God works. Just right now, right now, right now, right now. He'll work in the person who takes the trash out in your room, as well as the premier doctor. I wish you had the privilege to experience a hurricane where you're carrying your suitcase with two pairs of underwear and a pair of socks and everything, everything else you own in life is gone. It's the coolest experience in the world because you know God has got your back. In this world, hopefully so. In the next, I guarantee it. it has nothing to do with me guaranteeing it. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I thank you for your support over the last 177 days for my wife and I. God has our back, and he has it through many things, and most of it's your family. And your family works in ways you just would never expect. It's just so darn cool to be in trauma. It's so cool to be in tragedy. Because you, you can only you can only go to the Lord. It's just the, the best. My son wrote these words down, and I, and I finally figured out what it meant. And it, and you know I would expect this, uh, Jordan. He said, you know, please don't live in fear. That's the acronym. Please don't live in fear. Fear will kill you. Fear will kill you. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of uh, uh, has come unto me. Job 3.25. It will kill you. It truly will. And as a Bob Newhart would say in this skit, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Stop, stop fearing. Stop wondering what's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen to you. Worst case scenario, you, you die. Okay. I have an eternal life. Okay, I'll finish with this. <laughs> The Apostle Paul said, who shall separate us? We know this. He says, but for me to die is gain. But for nevertheless, I'll, I'll be here with you. For me to die is gain. Because I know the hope. I don't think about it. I know it. And this is why Paul could do what he did. When he was with Christ, I suspect, he knows the hope. He knows exactly what's going on. How it's going to how it's going to go down, okay? And that's all I really want to say. Thank you for your your support, to Carl and I. We do appreciate it. Um, God will continue to take care of us. He'll continue to take care of this church. We simply believe it. It's that simple. I love you. Thank you. Good morning. God bless. Jay, that was wonderful. Thank you. Really great. Now I can't complain about anything today. <laughs> really wonderful. Well, we have been studying uh, the last number of weeks um, how Jesus has overcome things and how we can emulate him in, in our lives, how to um, overcome like Jesus. 
And we're moving into this, we are in the season uh, where we're coming to the end of Jesus' life from a historical point of view. Uh, Resurrection Sunday is uh, two Sundays from, you know, well, two Sundays from now. And um, so what I wanted to do this morning was follow up on what uh, Matthew did last week when he looked at, uh, in John chapter 11, about the resurrection of Lazarus. I want to go to John chapter 12. Uh, but first, I want to tell you about the men's advance. Um, they got together and they voted last night that I had to leave because I wasn't manly enough. That's why I'm here with you now. And um, that's all right. <laughs> no, it, it, it's going really well, and I'm sure they'll give you a, 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 a what do you call it, a summary of it next weekend. And uh, it was been really, really great. Uh, last night, um, Christine Ham uh, was rushed to the hospital and uh, had um, emergency surgery with, uh, but she gave birth to a baby girl. So, praise the Lord. She's a little small, uh, what, a couple of pounds, two and a half pounds, but we all know because we have a couple of little girls that terrorize our church every Sunday that were <laughs> similar in size when they got started, right? So um, Christine's doing well and uh, recovering. She's, they're in that hospital down the street, you know, uh, the woman's hospital. So please keep her in, your, in, in mind. And John and Mary are here. And so praise the Lord. Father, we thank you so very much for uh, the great work that you did with Christine last night and for... Um, her and Zach, and for their new daughter, and for your taking care of this uh, family, and for your blessing upon them, and we're so thankful to you. And Father, continue to bless the men as they're up on the mountain there. I thank you for taking care of them, and for our time here this morning, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I, in the Gospel of John, there's a terminology that I wanted to bring to your attention before we get into John chapter 12, and that is, is that uh, it this is when uh, Mary and Jesus went to the wedding, you remember early on in his ministry, and they ran out of wine, and Mary said to, to Jesus, we need more wine, and Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. It sounds like mom is trying to push him into uh, making wine, and, but the point I wanted to bring to your attention is, he said, my hour has not yet come. In other words, my time is not yet in John chapter 5 and verse 25, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Well, the, the hour, the, the first hour where he talked about was they, those who were dead, those who didn't know God, were hearing from him because Christ was delivering the message. And then in the proper time, in the time in the future, then uh, those that are in the tomb will be raised, will hear the voice, will hear his voice. And then in John chapter 12, which is where we're going to go this morning, in John chapter 12, verse 27, Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. And, and uh, what I want to share with you briefly this morning is what was going on in the last week of Jesus' life. And, you know, as a man, he experienced the emotions that we experience. And, and uh, he, he's, he's able to sympathize with us because as a man, he went through a lot of the emotional things that you and I go through. And, and make no mistake about it, for him, they were as much a temptation as they are for you. And, but he, but unlike maybe how we have responded, he always responded in a godly fashion. So I, I really want to kind of focus on those last couple of days before he was taken into captivity and see how he dealt with his emotions and with his feelings, because that's really what it's all about. And such a, you know, what Jay just said is was, was so profound, because it really is, what is your outlook on what has happened? You know, how do you feel about it? 
How do you think about it? Because that's to determine where you go and what your life is going to be all about. And Jesus is such a, obvious, he, he's the greatest example of all. So in, in, uh, in John chapter 12, and in verse 1, it says, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now, in order to understand the chronological order of this, it says this was six days before the Passover. According to uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus was the Passover that year. Jesus, you know, the, the, all of the years that had preceded from the time that they came out of Israel for thousands of years, every year they were supposed to kill this Passover lamb and take the blood and the blood was supposed to temporarily cover their sins. All of those years and all of that with the, 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 the lamb was a type for what Jesus would do because he was the final Passover lamb. And when he died on the cross, his blood covered all the sins. So this is six days before his death because he's the Passover lamb. So six days before, and he knows, he knows what's coming, which is pretty profound, I think. To know that, that you have six days, or really, he had four days left before he'd be taken into captivity and be tortured like no other man has ever been before or after. Knowing that that was on the horizon and that he would die this gruesome death on the cross. This is what was going on in his life. And he goes to... Uh, Lazarus's house. Now, Lazarus and Martha and Mary, we learned last week the relationship, the two sisters, the brothers. And when you read the Gospels, it's pretty, well, uh, well Matt didn't really cover this, but in, in chapter 11, it says that when Martha and Mary sent for Jesus, uh, Jesus referred to, to Lazarus as his friend in the King James, or, and that he loved him that's the word I wanted to get, the word that he said he loved him. Usually the word love is the word agape. But in John chapter 11, it's not the word agape, it's the word phileo. Phileo is where we get uh, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So it's, it's a human love. Not only did Jesus love Lazarus and Mary and Martha with that spiritual love, agape love, there was this friendship love that he had with these people. So uh, I, I think as you read the gospel, it's quite apparent that when Jesus would come from Jerusalem, he lived in Galilee, when he would come from to Jerusalem, he stayed at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. They're friends. You know, it's, it's, that's a thought we don't often have, is that Jesus had friends. And um, so verse 2 says, They made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. Not unusual, right, that Martha would be doing the serving, we know from the other record that uh, when Jesus was visiting the house and, and you know, past that uh, Martha went up to Jesus, get Mary to help me here. I'm, I'm doing all the work. You know, remember that? And Jesus said, well, well, Mary's really doing what's most important. She's hanging out with me. Maybe you should let the casserole wait and come and hang out. But so anyhow, Martha's cooking again. Uh, so uh, obviously Martha was Italian. I don't know that at all. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was, the, was one of those reclining at the table with him. I, I can imagine every meal that, you know, Jay, uh, Lazarus could relate to you, right? He died and got up from the dead. This meal was good for him. <laughs> Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I love that record from every point of view. First of all, the love that, that Mary had. And to anoint his, nard is a, a very expensive perfume oil. That she would anoint his feet with that. And, and then wipe it with her hair. She must have had hair like... Uh, Valerie Fitzsimmons used to have that comes down, right, real lo long hair. I love that she had the love to do that, and I love that he had the love to let her do that. Because that, that's, that's a, I've had my feet washed before, and I've washed my wife's feet before, and uh, 
washing someone's feet and having your feet washed is not the same thing. It's a kind of an uncomfortable thing, a humbling thing to have your feet washed. And yet he, he loved her and allowed this to happen. And um, this is what's going on six days before he dies. But there had to be this negative side to all of it. Verse 4, But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? And he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. This is almost inconceivable, isn't it? He's one of the apostles. He's ripping off Jesus. You talk about dumb. You know, he's, he's pilfering the tithes and the offerings that were given to Jesus. He's stealing them. And Jesus said to her, said, to him, said let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. He knew his time was coming. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus knew his hour was coming. He said, leave her alone. Again, this beautiful, loving, great thing that transpired with Mary and Jesus. And here Judas soils the whole thing. He tries to, anyhow. Because he's a thief. Uh, and Jesus defends her. I imagine, I don't, you know, it's not hard to conceive how hurtful that would have been to have one of his apostles, there was only 12, to, to criticize the woman and to criticize Jesus. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly well assured that Jesus knew what was going on. That here he is stealing from him after, and mind you, mind you, Last week, Judas watched Jesus raise someone who was dead for four days. And this week, he's criticizing the family, the woman of the family, the sister, because he's a thief. I imagine that would have been impactful on the mind of Jesus. You ever been betrayed? I have. It's an ugly feeling, isn't it? Verse 9 says, Then a large crowd of Jews then learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake alone, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom was raised from the dead. But the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. On the next day, that would then be five days before Jesus died. On the next day, a large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a donkey, sat on it. And as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. You know, um, listening to your baby coo. Well, you know, considering the crowd here, it's not a problem. You know, I, it would be a problem if there's a bunch of men here, but nobody, I'm the only one that hears it. The rest of them don't hear anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry about it. Let, let, let the baby... Nice hair. Holy smokes. I'm jealous. <laughs> so um, Jesus, the, it was prophesied, it was prophesied that the king of Israel that would come, that would take David's place, would ride into Jerusalem on a mule and that they would lay down the palms, and this is what now, you know, they've referred to as Palm Sunday. They laid the palms down before him, their garments, and he came in, and everybody's cheering, and they're, they're, they're yelling out, Hosanna to the highest, and they're, they're considering Jesus is going to go into Jerusalem, he's going to overthrow Herod, he's going to become the king, and the kingdom will be coming. Well, little, they didn't know God's plan that Jesus had to die on the cross for us. So everybody's all excited about this. But they very quickly turned because the same group of people within a week 
are going to turn against, within a couple of days, are going to turn against Jesus because Jesus didn't do what they thought he should be doing. Look at Luke. We're going to come back here. Luke, Luke 19. Luke 19. Verse 41. And when he approached Jerusalem, this is the same period of time. This is when he had gone into Jerusalem. He saw the city and he wept over it. Saying, if you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have hidden from you, from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw over a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave you in you one stone upon another because they did not recognize the time of your visitation. The time of their visitation was the time, his time. He came to Jerusalem, he did all that he did, and the people did not repent and embrace him as the Messiah. Actually, what they ended up doing was crucifying him. So he, he comes, this is that same period of time when he comes riding in on the mule at one point or another. He looks over Jerusalem, and the second time in the Bible it says that he wept. Last week we saw the first time in the Bible, in, in chapter 11, with the death of Lazarus, the unbelief of the people around, he wept then. He wept for the great city of Jerusalem, and which I think is, again, symbolic or, or in connection, in harmony with the feelings of God. Because God wanted Jerusalem to be his holy city. God, God for, for, since back from the time of Moses, he prophesied, God did through Moses, that this would be the place where God would be worshipped. It would be his holy city. And what it ended up being was anything other than a holy city. A very unholy city. And Jesus wept over it. It was in, it was in this city that the temple of God was built. Which, by the way... Um, where was Solomon's temple? Megan? Huh? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so where was Solomon's temple? Right over here. See, that really wasn't a joke. That was terrible. Right. Jeez. Well, at least I'm consistent. Right. Anyhow, when you weep because you understand that destruction is coming, he's weeping because he knows that the city of God is going to be leveled and destroyed and the people of God are going to suffer and die. You know, he's weeping because his heart is so heavy. He's going into the city. He knows the people are, are, are elated about him coming in. They think that this is the time, but he knows it's not the time. He knows he's going to die in a couple of days. He goes into the temple area, and, and like it was when he began his ministry, they're selling stuff, and they've made the temple of God uh, like a, a, what do you call that? Well, you, you know... Um, place Mimi your, your father used to go to? <coughs> flea market. They made it into a flea market where they're selling stuff and making money. They turned the house of God into a house of merchandise. Again, the heaviness of heart, the sorrow that Jesus would have endured. Look at, look at um, Mark 14 for a minute. All this happening the last week of his life. Mark 14, now the Passover and the unleavened bread were two days away. So this is, so now we're talking about the day he's going to be taken captive. Two days away, because he's, he's, or the day before, he's going to, he dies, he, he's in captivity for 40 hours. So now the Passover, he's going to be the Passover 
and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and to kill him. And they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise they might be a riot of the people. And while he was in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper, and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. This is, not, this is the second anointing. Mary did the anointing over his feet. This is two days later. This other woman pours the ointment over his head. And again, it's nard, which is that um, oil, you know, perfume oil type, very expensive. But some, verse 4, but some were indignant, remarking to one another, why was this perfume wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scoffing her. They were, they were scoffing at her. They were making fun of her. They were ridiculing her. They were putting her down. Again, it says, it says that uh, some, verse 4, some were indignantly remarking to one another. Indignant means feelings of, or, or, or feelings of anger and annoyance at is what is perceived as being unfair and wrong. They were, and you know who these people were? According to the book of, the book of Matthew, in Matthew 26, the people that were doing this were the apostles. It was his disciples. His disciples were indignant that Jesus was allowing this woman, this wonderful woman, to anoint his head. Again, piercing to the heart. These are the people he, he, that lived with him and saw all the things. They watched him walk on water. They saw him feed the multitudes twice. They watched him heal the blind, give hearing back to the deaf. They watched him get the lame healed and the, the lepers cleansed. And here, they're, they're, they're judging him and her. How that must have hurt. You know, how, how that, here at this point, I got two more days and I'm dying, and they're not believing yet? They're not trusting I know what I'm doing? I love Jesus. And I, again, I love the woman for doing this. And Jesus said, because these women ministered to him at the end of his life. They're the the, what do you call that, hospice? That's who these women are. They're the ones ministering to him, where his men, followers, are criticizing him. Verse 6, And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me, for you always have the poor with you. And whenever you wish, you can go do good to them. But you... Do not always have me. She has done what, is, what she could. She has anointed my body before, beforehand for the burial. Therefore I say to you, whatever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. And the, the, the wonderful irony of what he just said there is, we don't know who she was. We know Mary anointed his feet. We don't know who this woman was that anointed his head. But I just got done telling you about it 2,000 years later. It's still being spoken about this wonderful woman, what she did to minister to our Lord two days before he died. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, verse 10, went, out, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And they were glad when they heard this and had promised to give him money and began seeking how to betray him at the next opportunity. Go back to John 12. So that all happens, and Jesus is aware of this. It's a very heavy, heavy time for Jesus for so many different reasons. Verse 12, on the next day, a large crowd 
who had come to the feast, when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took, we read that verse 16, these things his disciples did not understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, when they, when they remembered that these things were written of him, and they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him, because they had heard that he had performed this sign. Some, so the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Instead of rejoicing that this man was raised from the dead, they're jealous. Verse 20, Now there were some Greeks among those who were going to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in, of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and came to, told, to tell Jesus. These would have been Greek uh, proselytes. They would have been, you know, still, um, they, they had the... Uh, they were Jewish in, in their commitment, their faith, but they were originally Greeks. In verse, verse 23, now look what Jesus says to that. So these guys are coming. They want to see Jesus. Jesus answered and says to them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's the end. My life is coming to an end. I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised again. He didn't talk to the Greeks. Verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. And if it dies, it bears much fruit. Talking about himself. If I die, I, I, the, the grain of wheat will die, but there'll be much fruit as a result of it. And he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me where I am there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. So I just love this. Again, the intensity of the moment and the time. What does Jesus choose to do? He teaches, he teaches them. He doesn't get an attitude. He doesn't get nasty. He doesn't say, why are you guys you know, doing what's wrong or any of the rest. Rather, what he does is he teaches them. He controls his feelings. He controls his emotions. And he teaches. But again, verse 27, my soul has become troubled. My soul has become troubled. I know in a matter of hours, I'm going to be taken, tortured, and murdered. But this is why I came. This is what God wanted. Father, glorify your name. Then verse 28 says, Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of the people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Or others were saying, An angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, This voice was not come for my sake, but for your sakes, you, now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Jesus is holding on to the end game. He understands what's going to happen as a result of him suffering and dying and God raising him from the dead. And, I, I, and he, he's, he's confessing that. He's embracing it. He's keeping it in his mind. The voice, the vo this voice has come from, not, judgment has come upon, verse 31, judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world, that would be the devil, will be cast out. The devil's reign is going to be destroyed. And I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He sees the purpose of what he's going to endure. He keeps his mind focused on the end result. It's exactly what Jay was saying earlier. 
you know, what you've lost is everything that is not important. What you still have is everything that is important, eternal life. That's what Jesus embraced. He embraced the hope that was before him. He knew that what he was going to go through was going to be extremely difficult and hard. But the purpose was the reconciliation of humanity to God. The purpose of it was that eternal life would be available, not only for him, but for all that would believe in the future. That's what he held on to. And, and, and you know, again, the lesson for us is when the emotions come, and they do come for all of us, and, you know, and, and when the temptation comes to feel sorry for yourself or to feel depressed or to feel angry or to feel bitter or feel like you're getting the short end of the stick, which we all go through these things, maybe not to the extreme that some of us go through them, but the response should be the same. Not that of sinning, but that of embracing the reality that eternal life is right around the corner. You're not going to live forever in this form that we're in now, but you are going to live forever when Christ comes back. Going to chapter 13, you could continue to read maybe this week the rest of this chapter and see the many different obstacles that Jesus faced. But in, in chapter 13 is the beginning of the Last Supper. And this is, this is the very night that Jesus is taken into captivity. He will be taken into captivity and he will be held overnight. And then the whole next day, he'll go through this torturous experience. Then that night, the second night, he'll be there. And then that early nine o'clock the next morning, be led out to be crucified. Now look at this. In light of a, a knowledge of all of this, a knowledge of what is going on with Judas, a knowledge that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, a knowledge that his very close disciples were indignant about his behavior, and all that pain and suffering that was coming his way, it says in chapter 13, verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And during supper, the devil, having already put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and that he was going back to God, he got up from supper, he laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded it himself, and he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he girded. What did he do? He loved. He never stopped loving. And that's how we get through. We want to we want to emulate our Lord. We want to overcome like our Lord. And when you're pushed up against it, when you're feeling really bad, you're feeling abused or abused or you're, or you're feeling like injustice and all the rest Instead of doing what is so commonly done in the world, which is to get angry and bitter and attack, instead, love. Wow. Heavenly Father, please help us to be like our Lord. Help us to have that kind of, of reaction to the struggles that we face in life. Certainly nothing compared to what he did, but they're very real to us. We need your help to be fortified and to be men and women that truly are like Jesus. We do have Christ in us and we can do these things because of that. Father, help us to love no matter what goes on in our life, to forgive the people that don't deserve to be forgiven, to love our enemies, to care for those that don't deserve to be cared for. Help us to love like Jesus loved. I thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.